Welcome back to Campus Countdown. My name is Emily Sturge and today we'll be covering professors breaking the silence on China's human rights violations. The American Bar Association votes to uphold LSAT requirements in the DeSantis administration claims that universities are significantly underreporting spending on diversity, equity and inclusion. We will be covering these three stories and more on today's episode of Campus Countdown. In our third story this week, dozens of American professors signed a letter asking universities to break their silence on China's human rights violations. The letter addresses the former international students detained from the white paper movement, the protests against China's zero-COVID policies. The authors imply that universities remain silent because they fear losing research access, collaborations and funding from China. The letter reads, We, a group of scholars and students from around the world, call on universities, faculties, and others to speak up for Chinese students and scholars at risk. Traditionally, universities have prioritized their research interests while overlooking threats to academic freedom and issues of censorship. Few universities acknowledge the disparity in students' right to speak, let alone provide support to students when persecuted by authoritarian countries like China. Signatures are current as of February 17th, and interested students and academics can still sign the letter. Signatories include academics from Georgetown University, Yale, the University of Chicago, and others who joined this international effort to advocate for former students. In our second story this week, the American Bar Association votes to uphold LSAT requirements. Here with all the details on that story is campus reform correspondent Alexia Bianchi. So the House of Delegates of the American Bar Association recently voted down this resolution that would have made LSAT testing optional. So the vote for this was held on February 6th and it was held in New Orleans. And back in May, Campus Reform reported on the initial suggestion to remove the LSAT completely. And then Campus Reform also reported on this vote that was held that decided in everyone wanting to eliminate the LSAT completely. So then after that, the resolution was sent back to the legal education section for revision and resolution now 300 was drafted so that schools would be able to determine for themselves, you know, whether or not they want to keep that LSAT in their admissions processes. And the amendment states that it will give law schools more flexibility to innovate regarding their admissions processes. And then a chief argument that's also in this resolution, you know, argument for getting rid of the LSAT state specifically, that it will lead to an increase in the diversity of applicants and admitted law students. So then critics, however, like myself, have been pointing out that there's going to be these negative consequences, you know, to getting rid of the LSAT completely. So a memo that was issued by 60 law school deans back in September states that without the LSAT as a factor, law schools may be less willing to take a chance on students who do not perform well on GPA or other metrics. So as a law school student myself, I was really happy that the American Bar Association decided to go ahead and keep that LSAT. I think it's really important that we have that. I think it serves as an overall fair baseline for all the students, you know, from all these different universities in the country applying to law school. Because without the LSAT, there's no other way for these admissions committees to distinguish between the student that stayed up all those extra hours, went to those, you know, those professor's office hours, went, had to work harder to get good grades, to, you know, get those perfect scores and those final exams and those midterm grades, etc. And then the student that still got all A's, but didn't have to work as hard, put in that extra effort, maybe didn't go to any professor's office hours. And that's not that student's fault. It's just that that student still attained A's because they went to just a school that has lower standards for grading. You know, the exact two same students, the one student that was succeeding in getting all A's in that school that has the lower grading standards might have failed at, you know, the other student school that was up all night, you know, studying for that midterm exam the next day. So just, again, overall, just it's just fair. I'm happy that we have it. I think that getting rid of it would be promoting laziness, in my opinion. And yeah, I'm just really happy that the American Bar Association is going to keep the LSAT and I hope we keep it for the foreseeable future.
Back to you, Emily. Thanks, Alexia. In our top story this week, the DeSantis administration claims that universities are significantly underreporting diversity, equity, and inclusion spending. Governor DeSantis' press secretary, Brian Griffin, recently claimed that Florida's public universities did not accurately report diversity, equity, and inclusion, and critical race theory spending. Griffin said, It is our belief that the self-reported figures from state universities were significantly misreported and underreported. Campus Reform has extensively covered the DeSantis administration's probe into DEI spending at Florida State Colleges and Universities, which has uncovered at least $15 million in Florida taxpayer money going towards DEI initiatives, according to estimates from the State University System of Florida. Last week, the DeSantis administration issued its first public statement on DEI and CRT spending in the state, calling it an extraordinary misuse of taxpayer funds. This story leads us up to the woke tweet of the week. This week's tweet comes from Governor DeSantis's press secretary, Brian Griffin. Griffin's tweet reads, Here are a few shockingly wasteful highlights. The Diversity and Inclusion Office at the University of South Florida, which cost taxpayers over $1.1 million per year, the Center for Environmental Equity and Justice at Florida A&M University that cost taxpayers $1.8 million per year, the Chief Diversity Officer and Support Staff at the University of Florida, which cost taxpayers over $750,000 per year, the University of Central Florida Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and assistant are paid a combined $445,000 at taxpayer expense annually. That wraps up this week's edition of Campus Countdown. To read about these stories and more, visit campusreform.org. Remember to like and subscribe here on YouTube, and you can also follow us over on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Campus Reform. I'm Emily Sturge. Thanks for watching.